In this tutorial, we'll learn about effective nuclear charge qualitatively and eventually we'll also talk about how to calculate effective nuclear charge using Slater's rule. But before we jump into that, let's talk about nuclear charge. Nuclear charge is just going to be the number of protons inside the nucleus and assuming all those protons will be pulling on to the electrons that surrounding the nucleus. However, whenever you have a multi-electrons atom, then the valence shell electrons or even the electrons in the second shell or the third shell may not experience the same attraction as that of the electrons in the first shell from the nucleus. And the reason is they are being shielded from the inside electrons or you can also call those inner shell electrons or the core electrons. To clarify this better, let me take an example of lithium. So suppose I have lithium here, which has an atomic number of three. So that means the nuclear charge on the lithium is going to be three. And the electronic configuration is going to be 1s2, 2s1. What that means, I have two electrons in the first shell and I got one electron in the second shell. Assume I have this green color area that's going to be representing the first 1s electron cloud. So I'm going to have two electrons in there. All right, so those are going to be your 1s electrons. So I'm just going to go ahead and write down 1s electrons there. And then the 2s electron is going to be outside that green area. So assume that's going to be right here. So that's going to be the electron of 2s. And obviously the, uh, the nuclear charge on this particular nucleus is going to be 3 plus because that's what the atomic number is and that's how many protons you have inside the nucleus of lithium. So now there is nothing between the nucleus and the 1s electron. So what that means, those electrons in the 1s subshell will experience a full 3 plus charge or you can say a full 3 plus force uh, uh, on these electrons. However, when we look at the electrons that are in 2s, those electrons are actually being shielded by the electrons we have in the 1s subshell. So that's what the shielding effect or screening effect is because we have these electrons that are in that are in the inner shells or the core shells repelling the electrons on the outer shells and as a result the electrons in the outer shell do not experience the same type of attractive force as that of the electrons that are in the inner shells from the nucleus okay so that's when we jump into that's when that's why we say okay the effective nuclear charge is going to be the actual force that's going to be experienced by these this 2s electrons taking the shielding effect into the account however sometimes what happens there is going to be a penetration of the valence electron then that brings those electrons closer to the nucleus and that's what uh, that's what's called in a penetration now we still take the same example here so we have this these two electrons that are going to be the electrons from the 1s subshell now sometimes you may have this two electrons 2s electrons may be actually going closer to the nucleus all right so that's actually the 2s electrons we got here and if it does goes close to the nucleus, then it will experience the same type of attractive force as that of the electrons that are in 1s subshell. But that actually happens very rarely, or you can say there isn't a small probability of that happening. And how do you really determine that? Let's look at these graphs on the left. So we have uh, on this first graph, I have this 1s subshell. All right, and I got, let um, change the color there. I got this 1s subshell, I got 2s subshell, and I got 2p subshell. 
So you can see how 1s subshell is actually very close to the nucleus because on the x-axis we have the distance from the nucleus. And you can clearly see this 2s subshell, which is represented by this green uh, line here, this green graph, the majority of that is going to be outside the perimeter of this 1s subshell area. So this right there is outside the area. However, there is a very small amount of chance, so just focus on this side of the graph here. So there is a small amount of chance where this 2s electron can actually reside closer to the nucleus and it's going to be as close to 1s electrons we have in there. And that's, those are the times when this, when this electron that's in 2s subshell will experience the same attractive force as that of the electrons of 1s. But like I said, it's a very small chance, but majority of times these two electrons, two s electrons stay outside the perimeters of these 1s electrons and they experience less force and that's what give you an effective nuclear charge. So anytime the electron can actually go closer to the nucleus, we call that penetration. And that penetration really depends on what type of subshells you are in or what type of orbitals you are in. So usually the 1s obviously gonna penetrate the most here in terms of the penetration power. And then we have 2s penetrating after that. And then we got 2p and then we have 3s and then we got 3p and then we have 4s penetrating, and then we got 3d, and so on. Just how you fill in the electronic configurations. So as you closer to the left, you have a bigger penetration power. Well, let me take another example. The, in this particular second uh, picture I have here, so this green, uh, this red one actually representing the 3d subshell. Let me change the color there. All right, and this blue one that's with the dotted lines here it represents the 4s. So we can clearly see here, even though 4s is actually further away in terms of the, the majority of the probability from the 3d, but there isn't a small amount of chance that 4s is actually going to be closer to the nucleus than the 3d. So that's why the 4s actually has a greater penetration power than the 3d and when you do fill in the electronic configurations and that that's why 4s gets filled before the 3d get actually gets filled so the take-home message here is you want to make sure you know uh, what a, a penetration is and you want to make sure you know what type of orbitals or subshells penetrates more than the other ones so when you're just looking looking at uh, different subshells that has different n values, so these are going to be your n values there, 1, 2. Then they follow this order where 1s is going to penetrate more than 2s and which is going to penetrate more than the 2p and so on. However, when you're looking at the subshells that has the same n values, then your s penetrates more than the p and then your P penetrates more than the D, and D and rough, D and F roughly pen, has the same penetration power. So if I'm com trying to compare the 2S and the 2P, the 2S is going to penetrate more than the 2P. And similarly, if I try to compare maybe uh, 4P and 4D, then obviously 4p is going to penetrate more than the 4d. So sometimes they ask you questions like, okay, why do you really fill the 4s before the 3d? And obviously we can talk about the n plus l rule and say the energy, that's the energy order we have in 4s and 3d. But the other reason is the shielding and the penetration. The 4s penetrates more than the 3D, so that's why it gets filled first before the 3D gets filled. Okay, now when it comes down to calculating, well, before we actually calculate the 
uh, z effective, I want to talk about the quantitative behavior of z effective. Now, when you're going from left to right in the period, the z effective increases. And the reason why it does that, anytime you have electrons in the same shell, they shield the same shell electrons less effectively. Like another way of saying, the core electrons will shield the valence electrons more than the valence electron shielding other valence electrons. When I'm calculating the Z effective here, it's gonna be Z effective equal to Z, the nuclear charge, which is Z minus S, which is gonna be your shielding or screening constant. And that's, uh, that depends on which particular subshell you are really in. And I'll give an example in a little bit. When you try to calculate the, the Z effective, you can you have to arrange the electronic configuration in this particular order so when you arrange this in this particular order you put the first uh, 1s in one group the 2s 2p in one group so anything you have in the parentheses that actually represents a group in there so when you're trying to identify when you're trying to calculate the z effective for let's suppose 3p then you ignore anything. So if you have an electron in 3p, then you ignore any electron that's going to be in the 3d, 4s, or 4p. It's only going to be the electrons onto the left side that will make a difference in the z effective because those are the electrons that are going to be in the same shell or are going to be in the inner shell. And keep in mind the electrons in the inner shell shield more effectively than the electrons in the valence shell. Okay, so when it comes to shielding of electrons that are in either s or p orbitals then this is the rules you're going to be using so if it's in the same group so suppose i have an electron in 3p then the rest of the electrons in the 3s and 3p they will shield with 0.35 unit except if they are if, they, if we are talking about the very first sh subshell uh, those electrons will shield by 0.3 units. Okay, if you have an electrons that are in n minus 1 group, so that means the electrons in the 2s and the 2p will shield by a unit of 0.85, and I'll give an example in, in a little bit. And then the electrons in lower than that in n minus 2 groups will shield by a unit of 1.0. Now, if I have an electron, so let me take and change color there. If I have an electron exposed in 3D, then the electrons that are going to be in the same group, which means any other electron that's going to be in the 3D will shield by a unit of 0.35. And any lower unit, which is going to be any unit that's going to be onto the left side, that's including 3P and 3S or 2P, 2S and 1P, they will shield by a unit of 1.0 okay so let me take an example here to just clarify everything here so suppose i'm talking about uh, lithium the and i'm going to be calculating the effective nuclear charge on the 2s so i have 1s2 and the 2s1 rather so i'm trying to calculate the z effective that's going to be on the 2s electron so To calculate your screening constant, your z, z is going to be 3, obviously, and uh, there's only one electron on the 2s, so you don't have to worry about the other electrons in there, so that means uh, there, you, this, this first rule kind of goes away because there's no other electron in, the, in that uh, s subshell. Then the electrons within n minus 1 will shield 0.85 units. What that means, if I have two electrons in the 1s, then I would multiply this by 0.85. And whatever that gives you is going to be your z effective. So 2 times 0.85, so that gives you about 1.3.
and you know in the books they may just subtract uh, the inner electron which is going to be 2 as your screening or shielding constant and that will give you roughly 1 as your z effective so that's just an estimate and if you have to calculate the z effective more corrective, corrective then you would have to use the Slater's rule let me talk about maybe beryllium so beryllium is going to be 1s2 2s2 okay so I'm going to be calculating the z effective on one of the 2s electrons there okay so it's going to be z effective so the nuclear charge on beryllium is going to be 4 minus okay so I have one electron in the same group and that's going to be shielding by a unit of 0.35 so it's going to be 0.35 times 1 and then plus I have two electrons, so that's going to be shielding by a unit of 0.85. And uh, let's see what that comes out to be now. So we got 0.35 plus 2 times 0.85, and that's going to be 1 1.95. So you can clearly see going from lithium to beryllium your effective nuclear charge actually increased so uh, as you're going in along the period your effective nuclear charge increases and that's probably going to be the most important uh, in, in those cases uh, because you will be using the Z effective along the period when you're trying to do the ionization energy, the atomic size, and all those things. Uh, let me take an example of maybe uh, one of the D electrons there. So suppose I have, I'm um, talking about uh, maybe chromium. So chromium has an atomic number of uh, 24, and it's going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2. Well, chromium actually has 4s1 and 3d5 because it's one of the exceptions. So first arrange in the group that we're supposed to arrange according to the Slater's rule. So I'm going to have 1s2 here. Then I'm going to have 2s2, 2p6 here. Then I'm going to have 3s2, 3p6 here. Then I'm going to have 3d5 here and then 4s1 here. So that's how you arrange according to the Slater's rule. Now, any, uh, since I'm trying to figure out the effective nuclear charge on one of the electrons on the D, anything that's on the on to the right side would be ignored. So the electrons on the 4s1 would be ignored totally. So when I'm calculating the Z effective here, it's going to be 24 minus, now when it comes down to finding the screening constant or shielding constant, so I got four other electrons in the 3D, so if you have electrons in the same group, they will shield by a unit of 0.35. So that's going to be 4 times 0.35, and then plus any other onto the left side is going to be shielded by 1. So that means... Um, I have six electrons here, two here, six here, two here, and two here. So that's a total of 18 electrons. So those 18 electrons will shield those 3D electrons by a unit of one. Okay, so when I do this math, so I got four times 0.35 and then plus 18, that's 19.4, and that's going to be 24 minus. 19.4 gives you 4.6 as your Z effective on one of the electrons of chromium. So this is how you're going to be finding the Z effective using the Slater's rule. And obviously, remember the overall behavior of the Z effective along the period, because that's when it's more important. Down the group, when you're going from top to bottom, it's a different story because you got... Uh, different shells being added so your electrons are actually going further away from the nucleus. Alright, so if you have any questions on this, feel free to leave any comments in the section below.